Hello and welcome to the launch of the Australian Apollo service. My name is Melissa Burke and I'm the Australian Biocommons Training and Communications Officer. I will also be your host for today. Before we begin, we'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet today. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. We recognise their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. The mission of the Australian Biocommons is to build digital capability for life science research with the ultimate goal of ensuring Australian researchers remain globally competitive. We aim to provide better access to the tools, methods, compute and training that life science researchers need. As you're going to hear today, community consultation is central to the Australian Biocommons approach. And we're really excited today to officially launch the Australian Apollo service, which has been developed in consultation and in response to the needs of the genome assembly and genome annotation communities. Today, Dr. Tiffany Nelson, the Australian Biocommons Community Engagement Officer, will introduce the Australian Apollo service. She represents the wonderful team of people behind the service and will share the story of how it came about, what's on offer and how you can get access to it. Together with our partners at QCIF and PAUSI, we've also invited along some of the early adopters of the service to share how they've been using it in their research. We'll hear from Julia Volker at Southern Cross University, Professors Sandy and Bernie Degnan from the University of Queensland, and Dr. Rahul Ranhe from the CSIRO. So once again, welcome to the launch of the Australian Apollo Service, and I'm now going to hand over to Tiff to get us started. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us. The Australian Apollo Service brings together the genome curation and visualisation software Apollo, along with system administration, data hosting and support to the Australian research community. To glean biological knowledge from genomic sequencing data, it is important to understand, to interpret it in the context of other biological data, and Apollo allows you to do just this. In this webinar, we're going to show you some of the features of the Apollo service and also show you how to get an instance to host your genomes. The service has come about because of a national consultation with a wide group of researchers undertaking genome annotation. So what is Apollo? In the early 2000s, Apollo was built as a standalone desktop app application through a joint collaboration between the University of California, Berkeley and the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute. In 2010, it was upgraded to run in a web browser and this allowed for real-time collaborations in research at an international level to occur. This upgrade really broadened the study of a wide variety of species to improve their genomic features. A number of international research groups and organisations have benefited from the Apollo software as it supports large dispersed research projects. One example of these projects is the Vertebrate Genome Project, which has the goal of sequencing all vertebrate genomes globally. When we look at the Apollo software in a web browser, you have two panels. The genome editing panel provides an interactive area for tweaking or correcting your automatically produced annotations with collaborators. And in the administration panel, you can upload evidence files, your organisms and add or remove users. To highlight how it may be used, one example is of an international collaboration to curate um, more than 33,000 gene loci on the kiwi fruit genome. This was conducted by 93 annotators in geographically dispersed locations. Um, this provided researchers with an opportunity to correct a number of the gene models. These consultations that identified Apollo were conducted through the Australian Biocommons, which has been established to support biological life science researchers through the provision of bioinformatics and bioscience data infrastructure at a national scale. 
One of the Biocommons missions is to build software and expertise capability that will reduce the duplication of infrastructure management. Our goal in community engagement is to understand the researchers' challenges when it comes to digital infrastructure and to facilitate life scientists spending more time performing research and less time on computational infrastructure management. Many researchers from the group we consulted who undertake genome annotation work identified the need for mechanisms to easily share genomes with collaborators and also publicly, improve genomes through manual curation, annotation with the option for collaborative curation, for for it to be easily accessible with a well-resourced working data storage, and there was a desire to not have to set up and manage the system. The software Apollo provides users with the ability to collaboratively improve genome annotation that are the product of automated annotation tools or platforms, but has an overhead in deploying and managing the Apollo instance, which is non-trivial. We wanted to help solve this problem, and we have worked with researchers throughout the development of the new Australian Apollo service. We're grateful that some of our early adopters were keen to share how they use Apollo in their own research. And first up, we're going to hear from Julia Volkler from Southern Cross University. Hi, everyone. I'm Julia Volkler from Southern Cross University in Lismore, Australia, and I'm going to take the next few minutes to show you what kind of research we're doing at Southern Cross Plant Science and how we are using the resources provided by the Australian Biocommons, specifically the Apollo service. At Southern Cross Plant Science Research Centre, we employ both forward and reverse genetic approaches to help accelerate the breeding processes of certain crops. A deeper and broader understanding of the genomes of our plants of focus hand in hand with the phenotyping data obtained from the same crops allows us the identification of potential candidate genes and specific alleles of these genes that may be causative to the improvement of traits of interest, such as higher yields under biotic and abiotic stresses and higher quality or quantity of harvested products from these plants. Genome sequencing and annotation is central to forward genetic research and accurate information from high quality assembly and genome annotation enables the identification of precise molecular markers associated with the trait of interest, which can then be used for crop improvement by selective breeding, for example. And especially with agricultural constraints brought about by climate change, there's a need to accelerate breeding efforts for more resilient crops under stress conditions. To date, Southern Cross Plant Science, in collaboration with academic and industry partners, has published three genomes for the focus research crops. These are the macadamia chromosome scale assembly, the tea tree scaffold scale assembly, and the brassica rapa yellow sarsen chromosome scale assembly. These genomes can serve as the foundation for molecular breeding of each respective crop. Brassica rapa trilocularis isolate RA. 18 has been well characterized in numerous Brassica research studies. And at SEU, Professor Graham King leads the sequencing efforts and development of the primary publication for this genome. The sequencing of the sequence genome available in GenBank has an estimated size of 345 megabases with 10 chromosomes and around 43,000 predicted gene models. The genome and annotation has been made available to the Brassica research community through the Australian Biocommons Apollo service. And through this portal, it is ambitioned that the community will be able to improve the annotation of published gene models through the addition of experimental evidences generated by different research groups. And SEU has initiated the improvement of annotation of seed storage protein genes and using additional proteomic evidences from various studies undertaking at Southern Cross Plant Science. Another researcher is um, Cathy Knott from SCU, and she leads the Macadamia genome sequencing efforts. The published genome of Macadamia cultivar HAES741 is around 745 megabases in size, and most of the scaffolds are anchored to 14 pseudochromosomes using seven genetic linkage maps. Um, there are two annotations available for this genome, one with around 37,000 protein coding genes um, from analysis done for the main publication, and another publication from the NCBI with over 46,000 protein coding genes. The published genome 
and the two annotation sets are made available to the Macadamia research community through the Australia Biocommons Apollo service. And similar to the Brassica genome community, it is hoped that the Macadamia research community will improve the annotation of the gene models by a critical comparison of the two annotations and additional experimental evidences generated by different research groups. And last but not least, we also have the T3 or Melalukal Trenifolia genome project undertaken at SEU. Um, the main leader of this group is Dr. Mervyn Shepherd, and I'm part of this group, um, which I'm also doing as my PhD. Um, we've recently published the draft genome sequence for T3 in Gigabyte, and it is also available in GenBeck. We have around 37,000 predicted protein coding genes at the moment. This also leads me to the next part of my um, presentation, which is just a short example of how we use the Apollo web service for the manual annotation of the papine synthase gene family in T3. Just to give you a really short info about this tree, Maluca alternifolia is a shrub or small tree, and it's related to Eucalyptus grandis. They belong to the Mutaceae, and this um, family is known for its species richness in Australia and for the diversity of essential oils produced by these trees. These essential oils, such as tea tree, eucalypt, or lemon myrtle oil, are all composed of a wide array of volatile terpenoids. Here you can see three volatile components that are some of the major terpenoids that are produced by tea tree. And the last step of terpenoid synthesis is usually catalyzed by terpene synthases or TPS. And one of the main aims of my project is to characterize these TPS and to look at the TPS diversity and evolution in the Melocalternifolia genome. For this TPS characterization, I undertook a manual annotation of the TPS family, and therefore I had different inputs. So um, first of all, I had the draft genome assembly that we recently published. Then I also had two automatic gene annotations. One was created by FGNs H, whereby the license for FGNs H was also um, provided by the Australian Biocommons. And I created a second gene prediction using GeneMarket TFAS. And for both of these predictions, I use protein database and RNA-seq alignments as further evidence for gene structure. And now for the manual TPS annotation, I also created evidence in a form of alignments of TPS protein sequences to my genome, whereby I used the exonerate protein to genome tool. And I also had the RNA-seq alignments to my genome. So this is how this all looks when you view it all together in Apollo. So up here, you can see the FGENES H annotation track, then here the GMAC annotation. This big yellow track here shows the results of the TPS protein alignments to my genome, whereby the exonerate output shows you um, the different exon regions based on these alignments, and the little arrows here indicate potential spice sites. And on the bottom, you can see the RNA-seq alignments to my genome, and I decided to display them as coverage track, but you could also tell Apollo to show them as paired or single read alignments, so whatever suits you best. And in this case, I actually didn't have to manually change anything in the annotation. So as you can see, the exon regions um, align really nicely in the two different predictions tools in the exonerate output and also with the RNA-seq alignments. So I simply just um, took one of these predictions and dragged it into the user-created annotation track. Of course, there were also other cases where I manually have to adjust the gene models. So here you can see in the highlighted regions that the FGNs H and the GMAC predictions differ. I also didn't have um, a good RNA-seq coverage, so I didn't take the RNA-seq alignments into account and only looked at the output from Exonerate, so the TPS protein alignments to my genome. And um, then I just basically fused the two outputs from FGNs H and GMAC and always looked at the predicted exon structures um, and then um, manually adjusted the gene model um, in Apollo. In some cases, I also had to look closer at the exact genome sequence. So I won't go into too much detail. This is just a short um, zoom into one exon region. or ex It's a genome region, but Exonerate showed a lot of alignments to this region, which, so this is supposed to be a start exon of a gene. And um, you can see the nucleotide sequence in reverse direction here. 
together with the three different amino acid frames. And for the TPS, we know that they have a specific conserved amino acid motif in the first exon. So when I consider annotating an exon in this region, I look for um, the start codon that you can see here and the methionine in this frame. Then I also found this conserved motive that we know to be present in this first exon, which starts with the two arginines and stops with the tryptophan. Um, and I also found a canonical splice site overlapping nicely with the exonerate DPS alignments. So in this case, um, neither FGNs H nor Genmark um, predicted um, an exon in this region because of this stop codon in this reading frame. Um, however, I also aligned my raw sequencing reads to my assembly, and they indicate that one of the nucleotides predicted in this region might actually be um, an assembly error. So I decided to um, annotate an exon in this region, and then you can tell Apollo to treat this stop codon as a read-through stop codon and just continue to annotate the rest of the gene without any problems. So that's all the examples I wanted to show you today. I also tried out the Artemis tool instead of Apollo, but I found it really hard to use and it's definitely not as good as Apollo. So I definitely want to thank the Australian Biocommons and the Policy Supercomputing Center for the resources they provided to help with my gene prediction in tea tree, but of course also for their support when it comes to the other genome projects that we undertake at Southern Cross University. Thank you very much for your attention. Hello everyone, I'm Sandy Dagnan, and Bernie and I lead a research group in marine genomics at the University of Queensland. This year we've had the pleasure of uh, continuing our collaboration with some longtime collaborators in QCIF, uh, supported by Australian Biocommons and generously funded by UQ's Genome Innovation Hub, to develop a Web Apollo JBrowse browser for our non-model genomes, these are mostly marine invertebrates, that we've been working on over the past several years. And of course, the data sets that we generate for these animals have always been funded by the Australian taxpayer. So we've been feeling an increasing responsibility to find ways to share our data in the broadest possible way, the widest audience, and having a browser where people can visually interact with our data, we feel is far more satisfying than just being able to uh, download these data sets from NCBI, for example. So it's been very timely that Australian Biocommons is now supporting uh, the Australian Apollo. At the moment, our lab focuses particularly on two different species of local marine invertebrates. The first of these is a coral reef sponge, Amphimedon queenslandica the genome of which we published way back in 2010, so one of the very first Australian genomes ever to be published. And since that time, this species has become really fantastic for our studies in the origin and evolution of animals, increasingly in the evolution of genome regulation, and also now in, as a model for animal bacterial symbiosis. And so we have multiple collaborators around the world who engage with uh, data that we've been generating on this species. And of course, a, a much broader interest of people who are um, interested in working with these data. Over the years, we've accrued more than a thousand developmental and experimental gene expression and gene regulation data sets for this species, which now includes the genome of the host sponge, but also genomes of its four major bacterial symbionts. So here's a list of the kinds of data sets that we currently have for this species. Because of the complexity of these data and the very large number of different data sets, we felt that this was a little bit too complex of a system to uh, use as a test case for our Apollo browser development. So instead we've started with the second species that is the main focus of our lab at the moment. And this is the crown of thorns starfish. We published the genome of this starfish just in 2017. The idea being that we could learn about genome encoded factors that the starfish were using to communicate with each other 
and hopefully harness these factors for novel strategies for biocontrol of this coral reef pest. So in the last few years then, we've been accruing uh, transcriptomes and exoproteome data for this species from two different sites across the Pacific. And uh, we now have about 160 different uh, data sets that we're very keen to be able to uh, use an Apollo browser so that we can map these transcriptomes against the, the genomes and again allow for this visual interaction of these data. And this has then become our test case for developing a browser that we feel is the most valuable, gives us the, 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 the best usability. I'll hand over to Bernie now to take you through where we are at in terms of uh, developing our Crown of Thorns starfish resources on the, the new Apollo browser. Hi everyone, Bernie Degnan here. Um, yeah, so I'll just back up one step and, and just contextualize this browser in terms of the data sets that Sandy was talking about. And that's largely that, you know, so we have a huge number of data sets and there a lot of them are quantitative data sets and a lot of them related to gene expression and gene regulation. We want to be able to use that quantitative data to then interrogate the genome and actually look for regions of the genome that are particularly active in particular contexts. And so the, the genome browser is part of an armory of, of approaches that we use. And as Sandy mentioned, you know, we want to be able to use these data in a way that, that and present these data in a way that people can appreciate more broadly. And so here's the genome browser, and I think you already know about that. And here's some of the data sets that we have. And so I'm just going to walk you through one example on how we might use these data and use the browser to um, ask biological questions. So we go over and we have these tracks over on the left. And this is really important for us because this is a way for us to take these hundreds or thousands of data sets and put them in a manageable list that allows us to, to basically hone in on one particular question, one particular organism, one particular context, and ask what is happening in the genome. So the select tracks becomes very important. I'll come back to this in a second. So what I want to do is just first put up the reference genome that we use for the crown thorn starfish, which is this version 1.1 PASA. And so here, this is in this top panel, you can see what a particular scaffold looks like. This is scaffold six, which is nearly four megabases long. And then below is a, is a, is a, a zoom in on a particular region between um, 2.5 and three megabases. And here you can see a list of genes as you're familiar with. Um, and it just, you can select on any one of those genes, for instance, this GBR 0.6.185. And you can get information about that gene. For instance, this is an uh, intraflagella transport protein. And so that's all great. So we can contextualize the genes in the genome in, in terms of um, their organization and the content. But if we go back actually to the select tracks, this is where it gets useful for us. And so what I've highlighted here is the 602 tracks that we have from wild individuals. <clears throat> crown of thorns. And what you can see is when I select that, you get this huge list and that list goes on well below the page. And you can see that there's a lot of information. We have categories, file formats, organisms, et cetera. But it actually provides us with all the information about that individual sample. So for instance, you can see that most of the samples that we have here at the moment are related to salomic fluid. So these are cells in the salomic fluid. They're all females. They're all from, um, well, they're from Davies or Lynch reefs. They were all collected in the summer, for instance. So then we could actually go a little bit more detail. We can ask questions about any type of context. We can ask context about a tissue, a season, a reef, an individual. So here's an example of just one individual. We've selected individual 812. And we're going to look at one data set. And this is the big week data set. And so this is a data set of the transcriptomes from multiple tissues from this individual. In, in who comes from Davis Reef and lived in the summer. And these big wig files, which I'll show you now, we'll go back to the browser, look something like this. So we have these wiggle plots and we can see that we have each of the tissues lined up and that code in that's, that's next to each of the tracks can be moved back to the files and you can see everything about that code. And you can see the wiggle plots and you can see that we have blue and red. And so that's 
blue for forward strand, red for reverse strand. And as you can see, we still those those peaks appear to um, coincide with the three prime end of genes. And so there's a few little biological things that you would look up here. And you could see that um, in the case of genes that are on the negative strand with the arrow pointing to the left and corresponding red peaks, you can see the expression of these in the, in the tissues that we're looking at. And it's, it varies from tissue to tissue. And if we were gonna scroll along or walk along this, this scaffold, we would eventually find genes that were very specific to particular tissues. Another <clears throat> good case to look at here, excuse me, is um, genes that overlap in two directions. And so what we can actually see is we have red and blue overlapping with the, with the genes that are facing each other. So they're kind of um, head to head, if you like, and they, they overlap in those contexts. So these data are great to look at, but you can't get a lot on the screen. So we've actually developed another system, a heat map of these data that we can look at in both directions that we can compress up. So here's the exact same data set, <clears throat> excuse me, put into these heat maps. And so now we have the blue are the forward strands and the red are the reverse strands. And we have a heat map of the expression. And what you can see, I'll just highlight two regions. The two ones that have the genes face in both directions is that you have an overlap and you can see the relative expression levels. And all these expression heat maps and the wiggle plots are, are log scale. So they're, they're very useful in terms of visualizing the data. So just to remind you again, this, go, this is just one tool that we use. And so this is almost a quali qualitative tool to look at what genes are expressed in the context of a particular region on the chromosome. We combine this with a lot of quantitative data in order to sort of get a clear picture of what's going on in terms of gene activity in a sort of developmental, physiological, ecological, or experimental context. So this is just um, step one. And what we're going to do is continue on now and add more data in from the Crown Thorn Starfish and then embark on the larger project of getting the thousand plus data sets from Amphimede and Queensland to get mapped onto their genome and the symbionts of that, of that sponge. And we have a number of the genomes that we have in the pipelines that are in various states of completion of sponges and other marine invertebrates. So I'd like to also repeat as Sandy started this talk and thank our key collaborators, essential, um, particularly the folks at QCEF who have been essential to getting this, making this a reality, but also the support of Australian BioCommons and the key support of the Genome Innovation Hub at UQ. And thank you very much. My name is Rahul Rani, and I'm a research scientist in applied genomics in CSIRO. I'm here to talk to you today about our project, which is the Australian Pest Genome Partnership that we are running in partnership with Macquarie, Melbourne University, ANU, and the Australian Biocommons, amongst others, and is funded by ARDC. Australia's crucial biosecurity need at the moment is to protect its environment, productivity, and health from pest species. The key challenge for us is to manage the devastating impacts that these species can have on our economy, environment, and the way of life. As we start looking at the multiple management strategies that are now starting to come um, to the fore, all future biocontrol strategies are tending towards using genomics to guide the strategy in some way or the other, whether it be identifying gene targets for said strategy or identifying and studying the movement of populations before and after a biocontrol has been implemented. However, despite the significant progress that we have made uh, in genomics, there are still significant barriers to entry for researchers and funders. That's essentially where our project comes in. What we are aiming to do quite grandiosely uh, is the digital transformation of biological data and more specifically in biosecurity in this sense. Um, and this would essentially enable us to catalyze future research and applications and reduce the barrier to omics by making sure that we're able to make data assets such as genomes, population data, and software to analyze these, these data, to analyze these genomic data sets available to the public 
and in turn stimulate genomic research across many areas. And in effect, try and make some contribution towards turning genomics into a decision support tool. In doing so, what we're aiming to do, and this is going up our impact tree, is wherever there is a genome available, but not easily accessible uh, on some uh, repository like NCBI, we would make it available. Where the genome is, is not available, does not exist, we would assemble and annotate one. Um, and this would be defined by the requirement, whether it has to be long reads, short reads, high C, or any combination of the two or three. If an inappropriate genome is available, for example, the European rabbits uh, uh, were the source for the current rabbit genome. However, whether that is applicable to controlling Australian bunnies, we don't know. So that would be, uh, so we would create an Australian bunny, Australian rabbit genome. And with the genome data of the genome quality, the quality of the genome data is poor, we would aim to improve it. And all the tools and the data assets and the uh, you know, platforms that we make or generate and use in this project would then be made available. And that's where our interaction with Australian biocommons uh, and Web Apollo is really coming into its own. For every single genome that we generate or sequester or curate or bring together, we're aiming to make it available through Web Apollo. And the objective here is very simple, is to try and uh, make sure that all these genomes are available equitably the community can then take charge and then and curate the gene structures, for example, through Web Apollo, um, and also visualize all the different evidences that are required. And so this is really valuable for us because our mandate is to make sure that genome data assets are generated and made available. However, we cannot curate all of them, and that's where the community comes in. That's what we want to deliver back to the community, and Web Apollo is helping us do that, is to use Web Apollo as a tool uh, a well-maintained tool, might I say, um, to make sure that we stimulate this kind of research and interaction with the community. We're also then working with Galaxy Australia to make these genomes available for analytical, so in conjunction with analytical suites, uh, which can then also be used by the research community for research and educational purposes. In summation, where Web Apollo is really, really helping us is to make a significant, a stake, a significant step forward towards our original remit, which is to create locally focused, high quality genome reference data assets and to make them available to the community in a manner in which they can actually use it. Thanks so much for sharing your stories with us. It's wonderful to see how the community are using the Apollo service already and the variety of research it is being applied to. I'm now going to tell you a little bit more about the Australian Apollo service and how you can get access to it. The deployment of the Apollo software requires a full technology stack. It is not a simple install like other software tools. It also requires long-term hosting of data, maintenance updates and security. These aspects are completely covered by the Australian Apollo Service to provide any Australian researcher from a recognised Australian academic or research institute with their own customised local instances of the Apollo software for their genome projects. An Apollo instance allows researchers to work on a reference genome collaboratively and can support genomes of any size and is fully subsidised for Australian-based research groups and research consortia. The complete system administration build and deployment of the instance is created for the researchers with support provided through a help desk, along with other available resources, user documentation, FAQs and training events. All information relating to the service is accessible via our Apollo portal. To sign up for an instance, you can access our sign up form on the Apollo portal. The build of the instance can occur within a week before the team hands over the instance to the researchers. The researcher has control over the access to their instance, data upload and public view of the genomes or data on the instance. Regular maintenance and security updates of the system are operated by the Apollo Service Development Team. Organisms and their research groups hosted in instances across the service are listed on the organisms page with an opportunity for researchers to provide a public view only link 
to their instance. This list provides a national overview of genome annotation projects. The Australian BioCommons partner QCIF or Queensland Cyber In Infrastructure Foundation is offering the Apollo service underpinned by resources at the Pawsey Supercomputing Centre. These efforts are supported by funding from the Queensland Government's Research Infrastructure Co-Investment Fund, BioPlatforms Australia and the Australian Research Data Commons. BioPlatforms Australia and the Australian Research Data Commons are funded by the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Strategy, or ENCRIS. This webinar is the official public launch of the Australian Apollo Service. We look forward to receiving your signups if you would like your own instance. We will be offering a training workshop on the 17th of November. You do not need an inst instance to attend this training. It will introduce users to basic and up to an intermediate task of using the Apollo software. And now we will take any questions. Thanks a lot, Tiff, Julia, Sandy, Bernie and Rahul for those presentations. I hope that uh, for those of you joining, that's given you a little bit to think about. And now is your opportunity to ask questions. And I can see some of you have already been doing that. So to ask your questions, please pop them into the Q&A panel. We are joined by Tiff, who's just turned on her camera, as well as Maddie, Justin and Mike from the QCIF team who are here to answer them for you. So I thought we'd actually start by recapping a couple of the questions that have come in through the Q&A panel. And the first one that is, uh, has been upvoted by a couple of people is, what are the opportunities or tools for enabling updated community annotations to feed through seamlessly to Ensemble in the future? Uh, thanks, Melissa. I answered this in the chat, but I'll just um, say it again. So we're exploring the addition of tools um, such as a linkage into Galaxy. So there's easier transfer of data. Also, um, linkage to BLAST so that you can perform comparative genomics and also streamlining upload or easy access to um, up, um, what's the word? <laughs> Deposit your data into the repositories. So things like Ensemble. Um, that's something that we've firmly got on the radar of the BioCommons and it has come up in many of our community engagements. So we, we will be pursuing that, those linkages. Thanks, Tiff. The next question on my list today is, where can people find clear on instructions on how to use Apollo, for example, how to upload the data and format it? So on our website portal, our Apollo portal, you can find user resources, FAQs and tutorials. They will be updated as we have training workshops to have recordings of the, of the workshops or links to available materials on um, other sites such as the Galaxy Training Network, which, which has a great resource as well for annotation and also links to Apollo. We will be updating that as more um, resources and tutorials follow along documents become available. There's also links in there to other Apollo official documentation, which is, a, which is a great resource. There's also an Apollo official Google group that's international and the user group is very active on there. So questions can be submitted to the user group and, and be responded fairly quickly if you have a niche challenge that you can't get answered from anywhere else. Thanks, Tiff. The next question is one for Mike, and it's one that he's answered into in the Q&A panel as well. Uh, this one is in, inspired by Bernie's presentation, and the person asking it wants to know, um, sorry, I'm just reading it as I'm trying to speak it, it's a bit tricky. How do you, they want to know, how do you separate the RNA-seq data between the forward and reverse strand? Yeah, so luckily we have a deep tools available in the community and is actually is available on the Galaxy's Australia as well. So that's the tool I use to actually split um, the 
uh, on ASIC2 in the band format into frost and reverse strand, so which is really helpful. Um, the another great features with the Deep2 is allowed you not only output the band file, it's only also allowed you to output the big bit file formats, which is what use what people see on um, the deck and the polo that which is created by me. So yeah, Deep2 is the is a tool I use. Thanks, Mike. The next question is starts off by saying, thanks for making this available to us. Are there any plans to integrate other GMOD projects, for example, Intermine or Canto? I would find this useful for curating and sharing gene functional innovation, et cetera. Uh, thanks for the question, Darcy. Uh, we are open to value adding to Apollo where we can, if, if we have the capability to do that with our current deployment model, and if there's a, a user base that thinks it would be really valuable. So by all means, come and talk to us and email us if you have suggestions about how a feature could be added. Um, if there's already a template where it's been done, that is really good. And I know that th there is for the Gmod Apollo. So that's something we can explore. Uh, we're always trying to upgrade our um, services. And if this is something that a bigger part of the research community is also keen to see happen, then you know we will definitely look at, at, um, at supporting it. So you can always email us and let us know what your um, requests are. Thanks, Tiff. And I note that Jeff's just put the contact details for Apollo into the chat. And you can also use the contact us form on the Apollo website for that. Getting back to the questions, there is another question from Sarah that was inspired by Julia's presentation. And her question is, how often do you have to fix the predicted gene models yourself? Uh, yeah, this, this is my understanding of this is that um, genome annotation goes on forever. <laughs> as long as you keep getting data to support it, um, you can always curate and update and edit your genome annotations. So I think how long is a piece of string is a pretty good analogy that Sarah shared there. Uh, the gene models or the features of your gene models can be curated as really dependent on the quality of your annotations and your supporting evidence files, um, so which is dependent on your organism and um, many other factors. So That leads me on to a question about organisms and it is, can Apollo be used to annotate prokaryotes and other non-model organisms, including viruses? Yep. Um, any any animal that has a genome can be used on Apollo. Nice and short and sweet there for that answer. <laughs> okay, so the next question then is, um, could the service be extended to enable restricted community access and or data sharing similar to model organism genome databases? Uh, yes, I think so. Is this a question, not a question? This was a pre-submitted question, this one. Okay. Um, sorry, say, say it again. Sorry, Melissa. So they're wanting to know if they can use the Apollo service to, to, I guess, give the community access to their genome data and whether or not that can be done in a restricted way, so limiting access to certain people or groups. Yeah, sorry, I misunderstood. Um, so your instance that hosts your genomes is completely uh, private to you and you can share it with users for curation or public view only if you choose to do so. Um, the way the system works is that you are provided with an instance provided you're a investigator at an Australian-based research institute or academic institute and you will either be the person that curates the organisms or you will have a team 
I'll, another person that curates the organ, organisms. And that team can be as large or as small as you want. You can also have multiple organisms on your instance where you give access to different people. It might be the same people or it might be different people that act as the administrator or the curator on that organism, um, have certain permissions to upload particular file types or evidence files or um, curate the organism. And then at each stage, you can keep, keep that completely hidden from any public view, or you can enable uh, share access so that other users can, or a public view um, non-curator can actually look at your genome and visualize it. So community access is, is um, or collaborative access to the genomes is a really powerful part of the Apollo software and why it's so valuable across research groups. Sounds great, thank you, Tiff. Uh, a few questions have come in through the chat panel as well, so I'm going to switch to those now. This first one is, is there any cost for using the Australian Apollo service? No, it is fully subsidised for Australian-based researchers at a research consortia or academic institute. Um, your collaborators can be international, but the primary investigator needs to be, or principal investigator needs to be from an Australian-based academic institute. That's really nice to hear, thanks Tiff. And then another question's also come in through the chat is, what's the difference between Galaxy and Apollo? Oh, um, so Galaxy is a data analysis platform that allows you to select tools um, to support your data analysis. And this covers a wide range of domains. So genome assembly, metagenomic data, genome annotation. Um, there's probably a lot of other people on this call that are way more experienced to answer this, but I'll take a stab. Apollo is about basically a Google Doc for genome annotation. So you can visualize your genomes, you can curate your genomes, but the genome is the center of the Apollo software. There are tools that can allow us or um, developments that we can add to the Apollo service so that we can link it into Apollo. And that is so that if you were to take your raw data, you would maybe start with a Galaxy service. You might upload your raw data and perform a genome assembly and then a genome annotation using the tools available to you in Galaxy. You can also um, evaluate your genome and your annotation, and then you might move it into an Apollo software um, or the, your instance to host your genomes, and then you would go about curating your genomes. Um, before you, you do your, your next stage of the analysis. So Apollo is a step along the workflow of, of genome annotation. Thanks, Tiff. I think you captured it there. Galaxy does lots of different types of data analysis and then Apollo is the more specialized genome annotation curation steps. Um, a further question that is, has also come in through the chat is, what is the likely lifespan of this resource? And what is the plan for the data if funding eventually ends? We have designed the system in or the service in the hope that we secure funding beyond 2023. We explicitly state that we have funding currently until 2023, but we do um, hope that and plan for funding beyond that cycle. Um, probably through increased funding as, as Jeff has written in the chat there. Um, in the situation that we fail to secure more funding um, or find a, an appropriate funding model, your data is exportable through the Apollo software. So you have the capability to export your data from that service so that you can capture your annotations and it won't be lost on the um, situation that the Apollo service would cease. But that is a very unlikely situation. We, um, we will secure funding, or um, well, there's a big hope that we will have funding beyond 2023. But if I can clarify that a bit more regarding data, so we can actually snapshot the data that you have and you'd be able to bring up an Apollo instance exactly in the same state with all, with all your data and all your annotations in place. 
Thanks, Justin. That's perfect. This might be a good point uh, to ask about backups as well and what your plan is for ensuring that the data doesn't disappear unexpectedly. Yeah. Um, so we do not back up the large supporting files that you need for the temporary analysis, but we do back up your annotations. So things like BAM files and other evidence files that you need for the starting point of your analysis, um, we we don't back those up because they're very large and we wanted to draw a line in the sand at what we can back up. We back up all your annotations and they're done on a regular basis and secured at our um, resourcing operational partner, the Pawsey Supercomputing Research Centre. Thanks, Tiff. Another question that's come in through the chat is, uh, is there a limit to the number of instances that can be made available? To an individual user at current, we are supplying an instance for each principal investigator that applies. We, we do not have an, a limit on the number of organisms, but we do have a data quota cap at about one terabyte. You can request further quota um, during an interim period while you're performing or uploading your large BAM files and stuff like that, um, up, to, up to two terabytes or maybe a little bit more. And you can talk to us about that. If you um, strongly need a different, um, more than one instance because of the way your projects work, you can always talk to us. But in the first um, period um, and during the first cycle of the service we are providing. If you're a principal investigator, you can sign up for an instance um, with a view that this may change in the future, but currently it's, a, it's an instance per principal investigator. Thanks, Tiff. Okay, let me just have a quick look at the various different chat boxes. Okay, so I think we will leave it there for today. Thank you again to all of our presenters and to our, our panel today for answering questions. I'd also like to extend our congratulations to the team on the launch of the fantastic new Australian Apollo service. Well done. So as we wrap up today, I have a couple more things to tell you. So just bear with me while I share my screen again. So as Tiff mentioned earlier, we will be running a workshop on how to use Apollo in November. Applications for this workshop are now open and you can find out all the information about it on the Australian Biocommons website. You can also keep up to date with the latest news and events from Australian Biocommons by following us on Twitter or signing up for our newsletter. Thanks again for joining us. We hope that you've enjoyed the presentations today and we hope to see you again in another event soon. Until then, goodbye for now and enjoy your day.